Hello, everybody. Uh, this is a left edge appendage closure session. Uh, today, uh, uh, we're going to have the uh, uh, experts uh, panelists here. And uh, my name is uh, Hideko Hara uh, from Toho University, Ohashi Medical Center, Center in Japan. Uh, today with me, uh, Dr. Philippe Garrot uh, from France uh, will uh, moderate this session. And also, um, uh, uh, we're going to have um, uh, J.S. Kim from Korea and Dr. Lim uh, and also from uh, Korea and also Dr. Vincent Luke from Hong Kong and uh, Dr. Uh, Takashi Matsumoto from Japan and also Dr. Uh, Shusuke Kubo from Japan. Uh, they're going to uh, uh, work as a panelist. And uh, now uh, we're going to have uh, a live session uh, from now. Hello, Good morning Sibu. and welcome to CBC Frankfurt. And uh, thanks to the organizers for, for inviting us. Uh, we want to show you a case of uh, LAA closure. With me is Johan Raab, who is our EP colleague. We have uh, Judith Stefan doing the TEE. We have Julia and Selina helping from the cath lab staff. Let me give you the introduction into the history of this patient. It's a 72-year-old uh, female patient. She has symptomatic paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. She underwent pulmonary vein uh, isolation with radiofrequency back in 2014 and 2018 uh, in another hospital. She then suffered from suffered from uh, recurrent uh, AFib and atrial flutter. Her husband recently suffered from a severe intracranial bleed under anticoagulation and for that reason, she strongly wants to avoid anticoagulation. Uh, her current uh, clinical symptoms are related to the AFib with intermittent arrhythmias. Uh, past medical history includes mild to moderate MR, which is, doesn't need any treatment. Uh, EKG is currently sinus rhythm. TTE, uh, the MR is already mentioned, and uh, left atrium and right atrium are mildly dilated. The strategy here is to verification of pulmonary vein, vein isolation, then additional cryoablation if needed. Then we will consider cryoablation of the left atrial appendage because the left atrial appendage may also be a source of recurrent arrhythmias. Uh, closure of the left atrial appendage, which is the main part of this procedure today. We may also think about ablation of the martial vein, which is also a treatment modality in order to reduce the risk of recurrent AFib. And then finally, if we still have time, uh, isthmus ablation, because she also has atrial flutter, which is uh, another source of recurrent arrhythmias in AFib patients. This is just one of the trials which have been published about the uh, uh, isolation of the martial vein. And you can see this was a randomized trial. You can see that recurrence rate uh, when you do this ablation of the martial vein, which is a small vein entering the coronary sinus, then you have less risk of recurrent uh, AFib. And next slide, please. This shows you the effect of ablation of the left atrial appendage. Also in a randomized trial, you can see the effect if you isolate the uh, appendage uh, in addition to LA closure, what is the uh, purpose here? So uh, let's, I think the next step, let's uh, go to the angel first, Jürgen. Uh, what we see here is we did transeptal puncture uh, in a regular way. 
we have a pacemaker electrode in the right ventricle. The sheath, the transeptal sheath, uh, is in the left atrium, and the amplex extra stiff wire is in the uh, in one of the upper pulmonary veins on the right side. And then we did uh, an angiogram. This was uh, under rapid pacing, but incomplete capture, so the uh, uh, image is not so good. But what you see is actually the opacification of the left atrium, uh, which is not seen in the next cinema. That's why I'm letting it play here. Then I rotated the sheath a little bit more posterior, and we positioned the pacemaker in a better position. And now you can see the four pulmonary veins. Uh, we don't see any more the appendage because of the rotation of the sheath. So if you do an, a, a left atrial angiogram, that is important to think about the position of the sheath. But the purpose of this angiogram was to look for the pulmonary veins. Then we went on and uh, uh, Ken related, uh, introduced an achieved catheter, which is a multi-electrode spiral catheter into the pulmonary veins and see whether they are isolated. And we found out that those veins on the right side are isolated, but also the uh, vein, the uh, upper pulmonary vein on the left side, but the uh, lower pulmonary vein on the left side was not isolated. So this is the upper pulmonary vein, and the lower pulmonary vein was not isolated. So we did, or are currently doing, prior ablation of this lower pulmonary vein. And uh, let me just... Can we see the, the plural, please, Jürgen? All right. So this shows you the uh, contrast injection through the cryo balloon, making sure that uh, the vein is really blocked with, due to the cryo balloon, and then we can apply temperature. And we have done this already. We finished? Yes. OK. You, you, and can, uh, now we can test yes, whether yes. we have isolated okay. this lower pulmonary vein. So we stimulate in the lower pulmonary vein and see whether we see any. There's no, we see yet. the, uh, we need the other monitor, Jürgen. It's blocked yet. It's isolated. Let us show you the EP monitor here. So in yellow, this is the stimulation of the pulmonary vein. And in white is the signal which arrives in the right atrium. So that means we have now isolated this veins. So now all four veins are isolated and we can proceed with um, ablation of the left atrial appendage. So that's okay. what we have done so far. Um, let's go to the echo and then maybe two minutes for questions. Uh, Judith, can you show us what you have seen there? Good morning, everybody. Um, it looks like we have a challenging anatomy of the left atrial appendage. Um, here's a biplane view. Let's still hold on. With the first measurements at 65 degrees, it doesn't look too challenging. Um, the orifice is about uh, 22 millimeters, but you can already see here, uh, where is it? That there seems to be a side lobule opening. And in the second plane, you can see that there are lobules opening to all sides, sort of cauliflower type LAA, free of thrombus. And uh, we've done 3D measurements. And you can see here the opening, the, uh, the, the highest opening into one of the side lobules. In this area, we had uh, measurements of uh, orifice area from 21 millimeters to uh, 1.5 centimeters and a bit lower. 16 time, uh, to 19, um, 19 millimeters. But if you look at it at strict 135 degrees, you can see that this is probably underrated. The orifice here is about 24 to 25 millimeters and the landing zone is hard to, to see if we should aim for here that we have 16 millimeters. How long is the appendage? Seems to be a very short appendage, right? Yeah. From the orifice down here, we have okay. about three, two, that's, 2.8. That's, that's not too short. That's reasonable. So let's stop here for a moment and ask the panelists whether there are any questions so far regarding the indication or what we have done until now. 
Thank you very much for this uh, ex excellent presentation, very nice case, combining uh, additional ablation and left atrial appendage closure. So we've seen this appendage. What, what kind of device do you plan to use today? Well, the next step will be to isolate the appendage. We haven't done that. We have, to have only isolated the pulmonary veins. And now we will do cryoablation of the left atrial appendage. And while we are doing this, actually, you can think about what kind of device you would use in this case. But let's do the uh, okay. isolation of the appendage first. So uh, let me pull back the balloon into the sheath. And now, you did. you should guide me. Oh, we have to inflate the balloon again. I cannot pull it back. Fill the balloon, please. So, Horst, uh, this is Dr. Hara. Good morning. So yeah. th thank you for your uh, presentation. I have one question regarding the uh, simultaneous session or the PV isolation and left atrial appendage closure. In Japan, we cannot do that simultaneously, but uh, in Germany, can you do that with the uh, same session? Uh, I mean, PV isolation and appendage mm -hmm. occlusion. Whether we can do it, what do you mean from reimbursement yeah. standpoint? Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a problem. So, uh, but we found a way to do this in, in selected patients at least. But uh, usually the reimbursement we will get is only for one procedure. Now, when you now look at on ECHO, you can see that the achieved catheter, that is this multi-electrode catheter is just in front of the appendage. So we'll advance it just a little bit further. So I'm in the appendage and uh, Johan sees this on the EP monitor. Can we focus on the EP monitor, please? So uh, what you see these signals in yellow, these are the signals coming from the left atrial appendage. And uh, should we stimulate here, Johan? F8, F8, bitte. F8 um the stimulus of Lasso 1, 2. So we want, I mean, this cannot be isolated yet because this has not been done before. Just want to see how it looks it's good. like. So we, that means we are stimulating the appendage F8. and look at the uh, signal which arrives in the right atrium, which is the white one on the screen. And you I'm can fine. see it's obviously not isolated. That's what we expected because this has not been isolated so far. So now I will uh, push out the balloon out of the sheath. So may I ask one now more question? Can. Yeah, please. Oh, yes. Um, I'm wondering if you are using a CARTO or ANSET system usually or not? No, we don't have the CAR2 system. And for this procedure, we don't need it because uh, uh, cryoablation is really fluoro guided only, maybe a little bit of echo, but you don't need a CAR2 system. Mm. And that's the way which opened the door to EP for me because as you, as you know, I'm an interventional cardiologist, not an EP doctor. So uh, now let's inflate the balloon, please. Okay. So I will advance the balloon a little bit more. Uh, looking on echo, it looks good to me. Give a little bit of contrast, but very carefully. Okay. Okay, so let's now uh, ablate, cryo. Lass mal ein bisschen, bis wann ich sehe, was passiert. Nein. Temperature goes time. down. You only need the cryo monitor now. Dr. Sibor? Yeah. Uh, the left, do you, did, did you do the left plane of pacing during the cryoborne ablation in the left atrial appendage occlusion? Because the, sometimes the left the plane of palsy could be developed during the left atrial appendage occlusion. So yeah, that's a good point. Always you have to place the the patient catheter in the left to the innominate pain. Yeah, uh, that's a good point. Um, most op many operators do this. We haven't done this, uh, but it's a good suggestion. Yeah. Do you all do you do ablation of the appendage? Uh, 
Yes, but we okay. always do the paste the left plane over. Yeah, okay. So I can also do this under fluoro and see whether she is still breathing, which is the case. But uh, to do this with stimulation, that's what we do when we isolate the right pulmonary veins. Uh, it, is not, it is not enough to see the, the diaphragm movement during the cryoballoon ovulation. I think the plane of pacing is much better to avoid the plane of paralysis during the cryoballoon ablation, yeah. especially yeah. in the left atrial appendage occlusion. Okay. Have you seen our phrenical nerve palsy? Yes, I have one case. Actually, I have uh, the cryoballoon ablation case more than 500 cases. But okay. the one case, the left side plane of apology could, uh, was developed. And uh, in that particular patient, did you use the stimulation of the phrenical nerve? Yes, always. And it happened anyway? Yeah. Okay. So how often had you to stop the ablation because you saw that the stimulation of the phrenical nerve didn't work anymore? Yeah. You have to stop the cry balloon ablation immediately after. The How often did this happen? Yeah. How often did this happen? The one case, just one case. Okay. Okay. And that's so one case developed palsy of the phrenical nerve and yes. then you stopped. Yeah. And was this uh, phrenical nerve palsy then reversible? Yes. Okay. Okay, one out of 500, okay. Yeah. The temperature drop is not so good. Sorry? Temperature drop is not so good. Yeah, I Minus see. I'm afraid, I'm afraid to, yeah. I'm afraid to push more here. I mean, this is the newer version of the cryo balloon, which has a shorter tip, but still the tip is pretty scary. I think scary. there is Looks some gap. There is some yeah. gap. Because yeah. the minus 30 degree is much, much, yeah. better indication to the, the complete occlusion of the left atrial appendage. But I'm hesitating, to, so good. I'm hesitating to push more. Mm -hmm. I think we need a, a, a third generation of the cryo balloon for this type of procedure, which really has no tip at all. I think the segmental non-occlusive ovulation is much better to isolate the left atrial appendage occluded the isolation. Mm -hmm. Then that's mm -hmm. a, good the modality to complete occlusion of the left atrial appendage. So yeah. you should the non-occlusive segmental ablation is much better. Mm -hmm. But I really don't want to push more here, okay? So, uh, yeah, would, would we like to see whether it's isolated or not? It's probably not because there was a gap, mm -hmm. huh? Yeah. Not. It's not. Huh? Not. It's, it's not no. isolated. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's a pity. But I, again, I, I, this appendage is too short. I don't want to push harder here. Don't want to risk any risk of, uh, of perforation here. So that, let's uh, stop here and go out with the cryo balloon. Can we, the balloon is deflated? Yeah. Okay. It's deflated. Mm -hmm. Now I need the unplugged extra stiff wire again. This is JS Kim from South Korea. I have one question for the indication. Yeah. Can you hear me? I can Post? hear you. Yeah, yeah. I can so, hear you. Yeah. So I think that this, this, the, the indication of this patient is quite uh, somewhat, yeah, different from, yeah usual indication because there is just refusal of the anticoagulation. How, how potent is your patient do you usually perform with this kind of indication? Um, can you please repeat your question? There was some yeah, disconnect. Just, yeah, just how, how, how many patients, how, how percentage of patients do you usually perform with this indication for the left atrial appendage occlusion? Just a refuse? Refuser, oh, uh, uh, if the patient you. just refuses to take anticoagulation, that's rare. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, it really it really depends upon the insurance. Uh, I mean, if I would be the patient, I definitely would refuse anticoagulation, as you can imagine. But uh, 
uh, most insurance companies don't pay, but uh, mm. the insurance in this patient here agreed to pay for this. Yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah. This is also yeah some some issue in in Korea or other yeah other countries. Yeah, it's everywhere. It's everywhere. Yeah. So now uh, now it's, uh, selecting the device for this appendage here. Uh, we have not isolated the left ankle appendage, and uh, we don't have ARF uh, available here to do this. So it's not also it's not not standard of care. But still, if somebody later on wants to do RF ablation. I think a device like the Watchman has the advantage that uh, the ablation of the terminal ridge can be done easier. When you compare this with the AMOLED or with the LifeTech, you may cover the terminal ridge with the disc. So that would not be beneficial. So that's why I would prefer to use the Watchman here. And uh, please remind me, uh, you did the largest diameter of the uh, landing zone was how much? <sighs> Depends on where we measure it. We were somewhere around 24 to 25 millimeters. 24 to 25. Okay, let's keep that in mind. And I would like to have the, so that would be suitable for the watchman. I would like to uh, have the watchman sheet, please. Double curve. Double curve. Yeah. So, uh, are there uh, any panelists who recommends uh, uh, amulet or uh, like a lambre? No, Jace, how Is about that a you? question to me? No, uh, oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> to, to the to the panelist. Okay. I think if 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 there is a no yeah chance have a hmm. have a possibility to perform the uh, PBR isolation, I I can also choose another device. But oh, uh, Dr. Host uh, Host is already mentioned about the uh, PBR isolation. So I think I, I prepared Watchman in this case, but host, do you do you use uh, uh, Watchman Flex? Is it? Say again. Watchman Flex. Oh, this is the Watchman Flex. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So we don't we don't use the old Watchman anymore. Okay. The Watchman Flex has completely replaced it, and uh, it's it's really a, a big advantage. It's actually has the name the same name Watchman but the Watchman Flex is really a totally different device when it comes to the implantation technique. Uh, the biggest advantage is that you can uh, open the ball of the device, like with the AMOLED or with the uh, LifeTech, you can open the device outside of the appendage and then push it forward. And this really makes a big difference because you don't have to engage the appendage with the sheath as uh, in the past with the old generation. Actually, uh, Archman Flex is not available in Korea, so I have uh, no experience to use that wide device. But then, in in this situation, you do you uh, choose a twenty seven or a thirty one? Uh, the size. Oh, we will look yeah, at size the sizing of, chart yeah, device, in, in yeah. a second. Yeah. Okay. So, Vincent, uh, which device are you gonna choose for this particular anatomy? In Hong Kong, it's. Uh, I do agree that if you know further intervention or AF ablation is an is a concern, then obviously the device without a disc uh, will will have the potential uh, benefits uh, based on you know the indication purpose. But of course, uh, um, anatomy wise, you know, we know that these devices have uh, different requirements or one will perform better than the other. The majority of cases then it can be done with uh, both device, especially now with the new version of uh, Watchman Flex, you know, the um, requirement for the depth it, is much less, which is more forgiving in, in my you know, perspective. So I do agree, you know, Flex will be a, a good um, choice in this case. So is YY here now? So I, I was told by YY, so last year in China, mainland China, there are thousands of patients uh, who uh, were treated with the uh, PV isolation and uh, uh, left, uh, left atrial appendage closure together. So, so I think uh, in China, there are so many uh, experiences in the simultaneous uh, uh, such, uh, you know, treatment. 
So Shunsuke, do you have some idea of the Watchman Flex? You you have lots of the experience of the Watchman Flex. Yes, uh, in Japan, the Watchman Flex is, uh, uh, can be used from since uh, this May. So I experienced that a total of 20 cases of Watchman Flex. And I think that there, in, in this case, we have uh, uh, enough dips. And uh, the, the appendage is uh, not so So I will use. I will use uh, uh, what you text 31. That's what we're here. Da. Da. Mm -hmm. So now the wire is in the left appendage. Uh, we didn't do an angiogram yet selectively into the appendage, so we'll do this now. And I do this always in ARIO code for the watchman at least. So, uh, Philip, can you can I ask you to you a question? So, in uh, in your country, so which type of device uh, are you gonna choose in this uh, uh, anatomy? So uh, I guess with the, in France we're using the watchman and we're using the amulet in most of cases the two devices on are reimbursed on the lombri as well but uh, uh, it's definitely the, the good option for this patient is the watchman because uh, we want to preserve the, the reach uh, for possibly further ablation or something like that so I guess the only one who is uh, not uh, in in conflict with the ridge is the is the watchman could be implanted deeper, and uh, it's definitely the good choice for this patient. What do you think yes. about this anatomy? It's like cauliflower, as you said, by eco. And the size. Yeah, it's it's actually a combination of uh, of different morphologies. Because I will show you in, this, yeah. in a second, it's a cauliflower as well as chicken wing in one in one appendage here. So it's hard to say whether it's always hard to say where the landing zone is. So if it is here, then we would measure about 27, 26. Actually, that will be consistent with echo. Uh, let's store this here. But I will show you the uh, the Cineron and then oops. Mm -hmm. Then you can see that that part where the tip of the wire is, that bends away like a chicken wing. So it's, uh, and then we also have this inferior lobe. So this part here is kind of a chicken wing. Then we have, uh, and then we have this additional lobe, which is down here, right there. So it's really rather complex anatomy. So uh, let's think about the size of the, of the device we're going to use. Can we focus on the sizing chart? Okay, so if we say the diameter is about 25, 26, then this would indicate that we should use the 31 millimeter Watchman Flex. You can also, those of you not familiar with the Watchman Flex, this is the uh, landing zone and um, you can see that, for example, with the, let's say with a 24 millimeter landing zone, we could use either the 27 or we could use the 31 and maybe also the 35, which means with the Watchman Flex, you have a much larger range of sizes you can cover with your devices. So you don't have to measure so precisely anymore. You don't have to think about too much about what is the size because it's more forgiving than the regular watchman. So let's go, what did you say? 31, no? Okay. So when we have dimensions in between two size or sometimes three different size, as you said, the choice of the size would uh, be able to change the, the oversizing. What what kind of oversizing do you plan to have? It's like 10, 15, 20%. What is your well, target? Well, um, you can actually oversize as much as you want. So theoretically, you could use the largest device for a very small 
appendage. That would also work. The only downsizing of oversizing, the only disadvantage of oversizing too much is that then the device gets longer. But otherwise, there's no limit. You can oversize as much as you want. So uh, the distal part of the Watchman Flex, I will just push it out a little bit here, uh, is a closed uh, system. So this means when I open it, it's not have, does not have these sharp uh, wire ends what the old Watchman has. So the risk of perforation with this device is lower than with the conventional Watchman. Now let's flush it here. So, Horst, by the way, uh, did you check the uh, LAA, uh, LAA pressure? Yeah, good point. LAA pressure. Uh, let me just bring this back. We checked it initially when we started. It was about 10, but this is the time it goes. So let me recheck again. But Infusions is also running, so we should be fine. Let's check when I'm in with the, with the device. Of course, I already have connected the manifold to the delivery system. So uh, let's look on Flora. Okay, it's rotating back. That's what's always the case in LA closure. The sheath is rotating back. So I counterclock the sheath. And now it's uh, in a good position here. I pulled out the wire. And this system is don't need to use a pigtail catheter. <laughs> no, I don't need to use a pigtail. Yeah. <laughs> well, I use a pigtail when I do the initial angiogram with the pigtail. Mm. But then when, I, in this case, I exchanged over the wire and the permanent vein, and then I just use the wire to engage the appendage. I don't have to exchange for the pigtail. Okay, we wanted to see the pressures actually. Uh, it's actually higher than before. It's now 18. So eight, it's a good pressure. We want to have more than 10. The reason is that if the pressure is too low, then the appendage is kind of collapsed, which means you are measuring a smaller diameter than what really the diameter is. Another difference to the old generation is that this device has a distal marker. And connecting now the delivery system, that's like with the old Watchman, like connecting the delivery system with the sheath. And now I start opening the device. Now you see the distal marker. And I open it so far that uh, the diameter of the device is twice the diameter of the sheath. So you're unsheathing? Like that, yes. How does it look like there? Okay. So now I can actually, I'm advancing the entire system. I see that the device is flexing a little bit, which means I'm touching the wall. And from here on, I'm starting unsheathing it. As with the old generation, it's important to do this very slowly. Okay. I'm pushing a little bit. Let's do a semi here. Let's fill the sheath. Okay. Okay, now let's look on echo. Okay, as usual at 70 degrees seems to be a slight shoulder to the mitral side, but none to the ridge. That's lower. 
I don't see any residual flow. That is 70 degree, right? That's 70, and, yeah. and I'll go over to 135 in a minute. In a second. When we see a shoulder with 70 degree, then we probably have a huge shoulder on 135, but let's have a look. Uh, let's see where we are here. Yeah, there it is. Mm -hmm. So how big is that shoulder? Let's see. 12, which is really borderline. So we want to have less than 10. I mean, sometimes in life, 12 is 10. Okay. No flow, no right? No flow. Okay. Let's do a tuck test at this point. That looks stable. Let's uh, measure the compression. Yeah. Compression may be not enough here. No, it's not enough. So we have uh, actually this larger diameter. We measure here larger diameter than what is on the package. So I definitely cannot leave it like that. So I will recapture it. And I will try to bring it more cranial anteriorly by counterclock rotation. and then start again from here. It's tilting down, which is a bad sign. So, so how about um, uh, making a clockwise rotation of the sheath and then the uh, flex is going towards the upward? Well, I, I, I rotated counterclockwise a lot. That's what I said. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I, I understand. But uh, yes, the uh, watchman flex is uh, sometimes, uh, uh, you know, uh, moving the uh, opposite side of the uh, rotation. So if we uh, clockwise rotation of the sheet and the uh, flex ball is going uh, up, going to the upward uh, anterior part, like a uh, jackknife. Well, jack okay. Yeah. yeah. We can yeah. try that as well. It's, yes. uh, and in most of the cases, it's better to rotate counterclockwise, but we can try everything. So let's measure here. Oh, this is really borderline. The, shoul you, huh? the shoulder is bigger here though. Bigger? Yeah. Okay. As you can see here, we measure from here to yeah. here, we are 15. Okay, let's try a different way. This can be recaptured as often as you want. So I'm rotating clockwise. Oh no, this will not work. You see it's actually falling out when I rotate clockwise. Actually, I will rotate even more counterclock. And then the clockwise rotation, and then the tip of the uh, flex is going upward. If the yeah, there is some room, there's no room. I'm touching the wall. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's coming down again. Mm -hmm. How's it now? Didn't change at all, huh? regardless of what I do. Always the same. It's like the first. Hmm? It's like the first.
No, it's not good. So let's try again differently. So it's complex anatomy and sheath orientation is key determinant. And we, we the, the ball is going down when, when you deploy the, the device. Yeah, um, correct. Which means uh, that's all that always happens cases, when I'm touching the wall. So I, I don't have enough yes. depth here. Maybe you're stuck in some pectin muscle or something yeah. like that. Something. Uh, sometimes I go out and then go back again in the appendage to, to avoid this kind of problem. The beauty of this device is we can uh, recap uh, uh, many times. So. Sure, sure. And it's very safe. We yes. are the, deep in the appendage and with the ball, it's really a safe procedure. So oh, I, I, yeah. oh, yes, JS, please. Yeah, I, I agree. This, this patient have a very difficult anatomy. So uh, there is a two option. One is uh, we make a ball smaller than reposition again okay, to the more yeah, entry direction. And the other possible way is uh, sometimes distal space of appendix is very small and very elliptical appendix. Sometimes it's not so easy to some yeah, device when we choose based on the largest diameter. So then case that case we sometimes we choose a smaller size and then we deploy it again because very elliptical appendix sometimes it's not so easy to deploy with an appendix, which is a second option in my opinion. We Thank have you, a but, different yeah. configuration now. Mm. And here we have a good compression now. It's a Oops, oh yeah. different angle, mm -hmm. totally different angle. But there is a small uh, mm -hmm. lobe in the approximate yeah, of the gap, yeah, no? appendage. Yeah. Interesting, no? I think it's more deep, deeply in than before. And there is a little gap between the pulmonary ridge and the device. I could say, well, this is good for EP guys because then they can do ablation there. But the question is, is, is there any flow going distally from that area? I don't think so. Huh? So far, I haven't seen any. It yeah. seems to be compressed around here. Let's see. So Shunsuke, do you think uh, this gap is going to be a risk of the uh, DRT? I don't hmm. think so. So actually, uh, there is no uh, the jet to the appendage. And also, if you if you push a core wire a little bit, a device will going to be a larger or not. So I will push a core wire a little bit. So what I did is I pushed the device with the delivery cable a little bit more in, which kind of enfolds the the uh, actual surface of the device. Okay, so what I see on echo here is again this small gap, but it doesn't. No, you can you can yeah. actually see that a bit below that gap where the device is getting compressed. Yeah, that there is a good cooptation yeah. to the wall. So there's no flowing, no flow going distal to the device. Huh? No, these are artifacts. No. Jess, how, how do you think about the gap? I think a smaller gap, usually there is no issue, but this patient, we should discontinue the anticoagulation. So I think a complete procedure is more important for this kind of patient in my personal opinion. Well, according to the literature and the rules, the general yeah. accepted rules, this is not a residual leak. Yeah, that's right. Uh, I, I agree, it, agree. Yeah, yeah. So uh, 
because if, if this is called a residual leak, then all AMOLED and all life tech would have mm. a residual leak. So it's yeah. a leak is defined by going flow distal to the device, which is not the case here. But but the position of device is much better than previous one. I think it is is the best results yeah. with, with current yeah. device in my mm -hmm. my my mind. <laughs> I agree. So I think, uh, should I release? Is anybody against releasing it now? If so, tell me now. Otherwise, keep quiet forever. So Takashi, do you have some comments on that? Uh, I think this is uh, this uh, deployment position rather than the other different uh, other, uh, well, other so I think your, your voice I, is I a little bit. I, I could fuzzy. not hear that. You have to adjust your microphone. Yes, please. So Dr. Lim, do you have some uh, comments on that? Oh, actually, the, the in most cases, the endocardium is swollen after cryoburn ablation. That's why the smaller size device is not a good option to implantation in this case. That's why the, I think as time goes by, the, the gap could be demolished after the two weeks or four weeks after the device implantation. So I think that the gap is not important in this case. Interesting. In the majority case, the endocardium is very, very swollen after cryoburn ablation. Yeah, the, uh, so I will release it here. I don't want to keep it for too long because you see there is some tension between the delivery cable and the device. Oh, it's moving now. Wow. Have you seen that? So it moved after release. Okay. Echo is still in good position, huh? Reasonable. Yeah. Doesn't look too too much changed. Hold on. Oh. I have one question. Okay. Actually the the gap has become smaller, huh? Yeah. Yes. That's right. Yes, better. Yeah. So should please. Is better. Yes. Yeah. I think the position is good. There's yeah. no leak, and the compression seems to be okay. But the, uh, my question uh, is that this shoulder is acceptable, acceptable or not? Is it okay? Also, andrographically, it looks better. There's still some flow going into this little gap, which is, as discussed, not really a residual leak, but much smaller than before. Yeah. Okay, good. Fine. Good. Any any other questions or comments? So uh, may oh. I ask uh, yeah one question? So yeah. I think uh, yeah, there are a little bit a uh, smaller uh, gap uh, between the device and the uh, uh, wall. So but the uh, now uh, LA pressure is uh, eighteen, and uh, can we uh, uh, expect? If the early pressure is going down, the gap is smaller, and then the uh, device will be fixed with a uh, wall or not. That's a good question. Uh, I, I don't know that, uh, but I know that the diameter of the appendage may vary uh, about two up to three millimeters between low pressure and high pressure. So uh, yes, it could be if the pressure goes down back, but now it's down back, <laughs> it's 11. Currently the pressure is 11, so we started with 10, then before we implanted the device, we had 18. And now due to all this discussion, it went down to 11 again. So it's, uh, yeah, maybe maybe the smaller gap is also a result of the lower pressure now. I don't know. Any other questions or comments? I have a question. Yeah. Can I? Yeah, okay. The usually concomitant left atrial appendage occlusion after cryoburn ovulation is not recommended because the, the endocardial cell is much, much swollen after cryoburn ovulation. That's why the four and six months, six weeks, is much, the, the interval is very important to the, the uh, eliminate the, the endocardial swollen. So, so I wondering why do you use a concomitant to, to this procedure at the same time? Oh, that's, a good, that's a good question. First of all, I think it's not a downside when you oversize the device as we did here in, in this case. And uh, I mean, the second point is, okay, 
in this patient, the ablation was not successful, but we don't have that issue anymore. But uh, if we have a successful ablation of the appendage, then there is some risk of, of stroke because of the lack of contractility of the appendage. So uh, it has a downside to wait a couple of weeks, although I don't know whether there are any data about stroke in this situation, but um, I don't know. I mean, in most cases, it's a reimbursement question, not so much a medical question. So what, what is your plan for the anticoagulation or anticoagulatory strategy in this patient? Well, um, we will just prescribe our routine, which is AS, a, aspirin for six months and uh, clobidogrel for three months. And then we will stop everything. Hmm. Any other questions? Also. So thank you very much for this excellent case, uh, combining uh, LA ablation uh, and LA occlusion. It was a very complex case, complex anatomy, and and thanks to your uh, great expertise, the result is very good without leaks, with good compression, good stability, and uh, and it's very very important for these patients who will be without anticoagulants for the future. So, the panelists have other questions or. Can we close the session and thank you very much, Horst, for this excellent uh, procedure, excellent live case transmission. Thanks to all the team. And uh, thank you very much. See you, see you soon. Thank you very much and hope to see you next year, uh, not virtual, but physically. Thank you and goodbye. Sure, thank you. Congratulations. Congratulations. Thank you. So we had a... A fantastic live case transmission with Dr. Sivet from Frankfurt, and now we're moving to lectures. And it's my great pleasure to ask Dr. Hara, my co-moderator, to start his lecture. It would be a fantastic lecture on Watchman Flex about advanced technology and step-by-step -step procedure. Dr. Hara from Tokyo, Japan, please. Thank you, Philip. Uh, so uh, let's uh, uh, start my uh, presentation today. My talk is uh, uh, Watchman Flex Advanced Technology and Step-by-Step. -step. So can you see my slides now? Is that okay? Yes, Okay. perfect. Mm -hmm. I have nothing to disclose. So as you see, the, uh, the reason of the uh, 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 Watchman Flex uh, is the, uh, to improve the safety and also the, to improve the procedure accuracy and also the, uh, they're gonna expand. Uh, they would like to expand the uh, left atrial appendage indication. That is why Watchman Flex is created. So if you look at this slide, you can see the uh, point of design change uh, from Watchman uh, 2.5 to the Watchman Flex. Uh, if you look at the upper left panel, you can see the uh, one of the adv uh, advantages uh, uh, that is a visible distal part. If you look at the uh, fluoro, uh, you can see the distal part of the uh, device easily. And also the uh, most uh, uh, the biggest advantage of the Watchman Flex is the, we can advance the device itself. That is a, a very good option. And uh, this is safer. And also uh, we can recap and also we can do the partial recap many times. And if you look at the uh, uh, distal part of the uh, uh, left panel, you can see the uh, we can close the from 14 millimeter uh, to the 31 millimeter of the left atrial appendage landing zone. That is more than uh, those of the uh, uh, previous device, 2.5 generation. And the other uh, advantage is uh, uh, shortening of the device. If you we face on the uh, shallow left atrial appendage, uh, uh, we can uh, close the uh, with the with this uh, uh, Watchman Flex. The maximum diameter and the length ratio is 1.1 uh, uh, and the one, uh, 0 0.5. And also the uh, one of the advantages is uh, 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 configuration of the anchor. There are two rows of the uh, anchors in the Watchman Flex here. And the configuration is uh, uh, J anchors and not a straight anchor. That is safer than uh, that of the previous 2.5 generation. And also the uh, filter length is uh, uh, much deeper, l longer than uh, that of the uh, previous device. That is the, those are advantage of the Watchman Flex. 
And this is the uh, notorious uh, uh, center hub of the device of the uh, Watchman 2.5 generation. Uh, this is a uh, uh, main uh, cause of the DRT. But in this uh, particular Watchman Flex, uh, there is a 70% of the reduction of the metal part. That is a good one. And also, if you look at the lower uh, bottom panel here, uh, you can see the uh, there are 18 stress frames in the Watchman Flex. And the uh, previous Watchman has only 10. That means uh, there are less uh, leakage uh, than the uh, uh, that of the 2.5 generation. Uh, that means uh, uh, if we uh, implant the Watchman Flex uh, in the uh, landing zone of the left edge appendage, uh, there are less leakage. Uh, we might have the less leakage than the, those of the uh, previous one. And uh, if you look at the panel here, you can see the uh, uh, we can uh, there are overlapped uh, 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 device uh, uh, selection. That means uh, uh, we can uh, choose from the fourteen to thirty-one millimeter uh, the the landing zone. So. Uh, uh, we are uh, we can treat more appendage than uh, before, and the, th this is uh, how uh, we uh, use the Watchman Flex. Uh, what we need first is uh, we are creating we we should create a, a, a flex ball. Uh, the ball uh, should be uh, a double width of access sheet here, and then. Um, Usually, when we use uh, a 2.5 generation watchman, uh, we are using uh, we always are using an unsheath method. Uh, however, if we are uh, starting to uh, use the watchman flex, we can uh, do the advanced method and the combination method. So let's uh, share with my uh, case here. Uh, this is a 80 uh, years old uh, gentleman. Uh, he had a history of uh, diabetes, hypertension, and a CKD, and the long-standing AFib. Uh, the first stroke uh, was occurred in uh, uh, December last year. And the second stroke uh, was happened in the uh, uh, last April uh, with Erixaban. So uh, the previous doctor uh, switched uh, from Erixaban to the Damiatron now. But uh, his uh, chest vasque score was six and the heart score was four. If you look at the transesophageal echo still image here, you can see the landing zone is around the 90 millimeter in the zero and the 90 degree here. And the depth was around the 24 or to the uh, 80 millimeter here. And when we look at the uh, 45 and 135 here, the landing zone is from 18 around to the around the 20. So the uh, if you look at the 135 here, the uh, uh, depth was quite uh, small, uh, around the 14.4 millimeter, because there is a, a very significant uh, pectinent mass here. And the previous Watchman device, uh, when we are treated with the previous Watchman device, uh, we can access to the deepest part of the uh, appendage and then uh, deploy the device. However, uh, Watchman Flex was closed uh, to the end, so we can uh, uh, we should deploy the device on the pixelated mass like here. So that is uh, uh, one uh, limitation, I think. So uh, uh, let's go to the uh, uh, how I uh, treat this patient. Now I'm ro rotating, counter uh, cross polarized rotating the uh, pixel here, and then uh, uh, we did uh, angel here. And then you can see the where uh, we should deploy the device here. This is the uh, area caudal. And uh, now I'm making a uh, flex ball here and then uh, push the device with the advanced technique and then push. How, however, the device uh, was dislodged because of the, uh, there was a significant uh, tough uh, uh, pigment muscle here. And if you look at the trans esophageal echo here, you can see now I'm uh, uh, making a flex ball on the uh, pigment muscle here. And now I'm pushing, but the uh, device was dislodged. So that is uh, that was a failure, and the second uh, deploy was here. Uh, now I make a flex ball again and, and uh, advancing and going to the a little bit low, make uh, aiming a uh, uh, posterior part of the uh, rope, and the device was uh, it seems successfully. Uh, and when we look at the transfer as of Hajarico here, I actually I was happy with that. But uh, if you look at the device, tip of the device, there is some protrusion uh, of the device uh, to the left atrium. So uh, 
scientists of the Boston were not happy. So uh, uh, we uh, uh, did the uh, full recapture here. So uh, next step, I let's look at the floor first. I was making a, a flex border again, and at first going to, to the posterior part again for the uh, 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 quite strong uh, push, push, but uh, it was failed. And then uh, I, I'm going to go to the uh, anterior part and pushing and deploy the device, but uh, there was some protrusion. And then I made a small, smaller uh, uh, flex ball, and uh, I'm now making the clockwise rotation of the uh, sheath, and the device is a uh, counter-crosswise rotation, and then the uh, angulation was getting better. And the uh, position was good in the uh, floral, and the pass criteria was met, and I could release the device. Now I'm, I'm packing, but it was okay. And when, uh, please look at the right side of the panel here. Uh, that is what I did here now. So there was a, a significant uh, uh, pixelated muscles uh, here. And then uh, uh, I was uh, uh, going to the uh, anterior part of the roll. Uh, and then I made a smaller uh, flexible here. But if we push uh, uh, here, but we, uh, we, uh, we failed uh, for the first time. So what I did was I crook was rotation a little bit, and then the uh, uh, device itself is uh, counter cross clockwise rotate, rotated. And then uh, the device was uh, uh, sitting in the nice position. Angulation was getting better. That is uh, like a jackknife uh, uh, phenomenon. So what I did here was the uh, advancing method and the combination method. Now, if you look at the transesophageal echo here, uh, there was no protrusion here in the any degrees. So uh, that was good. And that there was no leakage and the 3D echo was okay. And the, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, the, uh, sometimes uh, we might need the, like a jackknife movement here, and then uh, we could uh, achieve the better alignment. Uh, actually, this was the first uh, Watchman Flex implantation for me, but uh, I uh, performed uh, more than 10 times of partial recap here. So uh, this is a take home message from me. So uh, uh, when we uh, use the Watchman Flex, we can perform controlled deployment. This is um, a greater advantage than that of the 2.5 generation. And also uh, we can do the complete recap and reuse many times. Uh, that is uh, so nice. And also the Larger ranges of the uh, left to edge appendage uh, uh, can be closed with the Watchman Flex than the previous uh, device. And also we're gonna have the better seal and healing uh, with the uh, Watchman uh, Flex. Uh, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Hara, a fantastic talk. And uh, you illustrate how the improvements of this new generation Watchman Flex has done uh, compared to the previous generation. And in particular, what you've seen is that you can adjust the, the degree of, uh, of deployment of the ball, and then you can navigate into the left atrial appendage, which is sometimes very useful as, you, as you've seen in, in this presentation. Um, uh, one other point is that using this ball uh, technique and the, the recapture uh, technique, you can have a more a safer procedure, which is a, a very important point, of course, for the patients. Uh, how would you, uh, panelists, uh, do you have some questions or how would you comment uh, about the Watchman Flex and Dr. Harris' presentation? Uh, can I ask one question? So my question is, uh, so now you can uh, create a little bit of shadow, uh, shadow left appendage and a little bit larger left appendage. So did, did you try some case that you Ejected during when you can could only use uh, Watchman 2.5. Ah, so your question is, uh, how about uh, using the 2.5 one? Uh, the, the, did you try uh, some case with the flex that uh, you reject during you can only you could only use 2.5 device? Ah, uh, yeah. I we just started the Watchman flex from the May, so. Uh, yeah, I uh, I think uh, there is uh, such a uh, patient. Um, if we fail to the Watchman 2.5 generation, I think uh, it is better 
uh, to use a watch on Forex. But uh, yeah, sometimes uh, as you see, the there are too much, uh, too uh, complex anatomy of the uh, left edge appendix. So I think uh, some uh, anatomy uh, cannot allow uh, even in a watchman flex, I think. So Dr. Har mentioned about the, uh, the uh, impression technique, so advanced technique, ANSYS technique, and the combination technique. So which is better to put a uh, watchman flex? In oh. my opinion. Yes. So at first, I tried to put the uh, uh, watchman by advanced technique, but it it is not 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 so good because uh, the coaxiality is a uh, is a uh, changes uh, by the advancing uh, the device. So how about uh, your opinion? Oh, thank you very much. I agree with you. So yeah, uh, usually I use the advanced technique first, and then if the co coaxiality coaxiality is going to be better, I think uh, we can deploy the device. But uh, 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 in my uh, slides, uh, there was uh, no, uh, uh, not a good coaxiality usually. So not always the good coaxiality. So uh, uh, I think uh, we can change the ang angulation of the device using uh, clockwise or counterclockwise rotation. And then we can, we should uh, remember the, how the, uh, a tip of the flex uh, will move to the uh, other way, other part, and then uh, we can uh, uh, make the coaxiality better. Uh, that is a good point. Thank you. So you uh, you mentioned, but uh, I think the combination technique is uh, it, that's uh, right. better than uh, uh, other technique. So yeah, I that's agree. right. Yeah, and but the the, uh, the beauty of the device is uh, we can uh, 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 do the partial recap many times, and the, if the one lobe is not enough to deploy the device. We can choose the other lobes. Yes. Yeah, that is a good one, yeah. Other questions from panelists? So, yeah, this is J.S. Kim, I, I have one question. I think that the wide range of overlap to device selection in the uh, device charting, which can be an uh, advantage, but there is some concern because there is some wide overlap, some yeah, device charts that then some some measurement is uh, is we can choose uh, three device sometimes. So is there any special specific consideration choose the some certain device in certain anatomy? Yes, yeah, yes. Thank you so much for your question. I totally agree with you. So yeah, I sometimes uh, uh, it's totally uh, confusing if we can choose uh, more devices, but uh, I think uh, too much. Uh, too large device uh, is not going to be uh, working for this uh, uh, particular uh, for flex. So if we use a, a 2.5 generation, we sometimes uh, uh, size up, may make a size up, making a size up. But uh, when we use a flex, I think uh, sometimes we can, we should uh, downsize the device and the uh, device will fit the appendage very nicely. So I think, uh, uh, appropriate size uh, choosing is uh, uh, mandatory, but uh, yeah, your point is correct. Uh, sometimes it's gonna be confusing, but I think uh, yes. The uh, uh, one other stuff I need to mention is uh, uh, from ten percent to to thirty thirty percent of the compression should be needed. So I think uh, yeah, uh, we should uh, watch the chart and then uh, we should calculate how much compression should be uh, should be got. Uh, from that, yes. That's a very important point because we have to to balance the risk of uh, of uh, too much compression and the risk of protrusion that we've seen during the live case transmission, and the risk of uh, uh, device embolization. If you undersize, you might have some embolization risk, which is uh, which is of course uh, obvious and very important. So. Um, there, in, when you're in between two sizes for the device uh, size selection, uh, we, we, we still have to keep in mind that we have to compress, but not too much between 10 to 20%, but not like 40, 50%, and not like no compression or less than 10%. So it's always uh, very important to look at the pressure as we, we've seen during the life case transmission uh, and trust in your uh, imaging techniques. Uh, I have a question about imaging. Uh, uh, how would you uh, plan the, this kind of procedure with you seen during live case transmission? Would you do only eco? Would you do some CT? 
because in my country we are doing CT for most of the patients as we as we do for TAVI, for example. I think in Japan nowadays, uh, many doctors would like to perform the CT scan beforehand. So, but in this, uh, in my slide, uh, the patient had a, a chronic kidney disease, so I avoided to do that. But uh, yeah, in the uh, previous uh, uh, live case, I think uh, yeah, CT scan should be uh, would be needed to understand the anatomy. Yes. So in, in our institution, we have also same similar situation. We usually prepare a CT scan before the procedure without performing T then, but I usually try to perform the procedure under guidance T, transverse project cardiography rather than ICE. But Dr. Im usually use ICE, isn't it? <laughs> so it's different, yeah, some preference uh, among the, uh, some different positions. So JS, can I ask a question to you? So I think uh, in uh, Yonsei University, so you have the CT scan in the hybrid OR. So do you, can you use uh, such a CT scan during the procedure or? Uh, yeah, actually very important question. We have a CT co-registered angio machine in, in our cast room, but it is not that useful <laughs> until now because during the procedure is very somewhat, yeah, not so easy to use a CT scan during the procedure. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So thank you very much again, Dr. Hara, for uh, this excellent presentation about Watchman and step-by-step -step procedure. Uh, I think we can move on. Okay, thank you, Philip. And uh, our next talk is uh, from uh, Dr. Philip Garrett. And he's going to talk about the LAO challenging cases, advanced techniques, and new devices. Phyllis, please, please start your presentation. So uh, left atrial appendage occlusion challenging cases, uh, advanced techniques, and we're going to talk about uh, imaging and, and new devices. How can we improve the results of this presentation? Uh, we, we, we don't I don't have any conflict of interest to disclose for this presentation. Uh, challenging procedures, you know, uh, could be uh, related to uh, complex anatomy or to device. And we have some problems during procedures about coaxiality, but about also conformability of the device. And positioning and sizing of the device is crucial uh, to ensure a good procedure and good result. And these are the different complications we can, uh, we can have during challenging procedures, peri-device leaks, uh, incomplete occlusion, device embolism, sometimes tamponade and stroke, or device-related thrombosis can occur uh, later after the procedures. So these procedural complications may occur more frequently when the procedure is challenging. This is from the evolution registry with the watchman. And you see that the risk of, uh, of uh, implant failure uh, was about 10% for the PROTECT trial, but it's now about one to 2% in the modern era. And uh, as well, the risk of uh, device-related serious adverse events at seven days, within seven days of the procedure, has decreased from 8.7% to less than 3% in the modern era. So not so much cases, but in some cases, really challenges procedures. So how advanced techniques and new devices may improve the results of these complex procedures. This is a case-based example of a very large left atrial appendage closure. You can see here the CT of this uh, left atrium and left atrial appendage. It's a really huge uh, appendage. You can see here uh, in 3D, but also in planar uh, uh, volumes. This is uh, uh, what we had with the three months your uh, software. And you can see that the hostium of the appendage is really huge with an average diameter of 40.3 millimeter. 10 millimeters inside the appendage. Uh, the average diameter was 35.5, 34.5 millimeter, which is still huge. And we, for these patients, had the problem of uh, would this appendage where standard sizing of, and, and, and the, the first answer was not, and we discussed about the case and which device and which position we could implant. So we had the, the, the help of the 
computer-based simulation technology. This is a FIOPS uh, um, uh, company uh, based in Ghent in Belgium. And you can see that we have uh, simulated the positioning of a huge 34 amulet inside this appendage. And on the standard positioning, we had uh, no compression of the lobe. And this ceiling looks not so bad, but uh, we felt that without compression and without a so good a position of the lobe, there would be a risk of device embolization. So uh, to uh, adjust to anatomical sizing, we decided to look at what would be uh, the procedure if we would go deeper inside this appendage. And you see here more than 10 millimeter inside the appendage. We had an average uh, diameter of 29.9. And we decided to start the procedure with an amulet 34 going deeper than the previous uh, positioning that we simulated. And this is uh, the planification of, this, of the procedure. You can see here using uh, Trimancio, we have some nice uh, 3D videos of the left atrium, the ostium, and the landing zone. And we have simulated a catheter, a double cuff catheter and, uh, and transeptal uh, punctioning inferior part of the transept. And this is the, 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 the procedure we've done. This is our routine uh, technique to work with uh, CT and angiofusion on the screen. You see the, 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 the blue uh, circle is the ostium, the red circle is the uh, landing zone, and we also have the yellow circle, which is the ring of the mitral, and the green, the green circle, which is the fossa ovalis. And you see here uh, that we try to do our best to position the device on the landing zone. It was a deep uh, positioning uh, for this, uh, uh, for this uh, procedure. And this is the final result we get here with a good compression of the device and good positioning, you can see that the disc is at the position we were planning to go and, uh, and the lobe as well. This is the result we had in this patient at six months CT and you see that the ceiling of the disc was good with no conflict to the vein or to the mitral ring. And this is uh, what we had uh, with uh, CT with an occluded uh, left atrial appendage and uh, and very nice uh, result of the device at six months. So again, I think that advanced techniques and especially uh, imaging techniques may help anticipate difficulties in some patients. Case planification is obviously important in some challenging cases. It may help device sizing and device positioning, and it may facilitate the procedure. Uh, improving left atrial appended occlusion rates in some cases is also a main goal of advanced technologies. So second part is how new devices can overcome challenging procedures. Failure to implant and periprocedural serious adverse events are still what we want to, to fight. So there is the, some new devices you see here, the SILA, which is a LA occluder in two parts, it's a plate on a waist, so an additional seal disc uh, that may help uh, for better uh, left atrial appendage occlusion. It's come with a uh, low profile delivery sheets, as small but strong hooks, and is fully retrievable and repositionable. So the device has been uh, studied in a registry. You can see here that the success rate was good, 163 on 168 and the rate of peri-device leak, significant peri-device leaks at 12 months was, was near zero, was zero on one and 52 patients. The risk of device-related thrombosis was uh, observed in four patients and the risk of stroke has occurred in two patients on 152 patients. Another device is the conformal LAA seal. It's the class implant and uh, it's a form-based architecture designed to address the wide spectrum of left atrial appendage anatomies. It comes in two sizes, and uh, for this procedure, we don't need uh, a regular use of uh, general anesthesia and TEE. You can see here the regular uh, device on the left uh, uh, panel, uh, 27 regular, and large device, which is 35, the two sizes that we have for this uh, device. 
And on the right panel, you can see that we may implant this in a half axis positioning, which is different of, of what we had with uh, regular devices that we are using uh, today. And also the fact that we don't have any cable, but we have a, a, a thin uh, needle uh, uh, suture to, to, to uh, fix the, the device is also you don't have the risk of, uh, of pulling the device when you position it. So the conformal LAA seal has been studied in early feasibility studies. This is the result of the Prague, some results of the Prague single center study in 15 patients. The success was observed in all patients and left atrial appendage were quite a, a good range from 11 to 28 millimeter. They didn't use TE, they observed no complication. Another early feasibility study in the US in four centers, 22 patients, the success was, was done, was achieved in 18 on 22 patients and LAA were uh, ranged from nine to 31 millimeter. They used TE, they observed two leaks and one device related thrombosis. Next step is the uh, randomized trial, the pivotal trial. And the randomized trial will compare the class device with the watchman. It's a one one randomization, prospective multi center randomized clinical trial with 1,400 patients uh, recruited. Recruitment is, uh, is about to start. And the primary endpoint is, as you see, the one-year clinical events and device seal. And secondary endpoints is 18 months stroke and systemic embolism. Another device is the applicator. Uh, this is another type of, uh, of concept. The applicator is a closure without implant. So it seems simpler than device closure. We don't need some uh, LA measurements and possibly one size will fit for, with uh, quite all anatomies. It's simpler than the transpericardial LAE closure, and you can have a complete sealing uh, invagination of the appendage, as you can observe in this video. You see here that the device is like a, a invagination, a, a section of the, of the appendage that could be completely reversed into the left atrium and then could be fixed as, as it's mentioned on these videos. And you can see on the right panel, the result at, on the CT, control CT, which is very good without any uh, um, device inside the appendage, but there is some invagination of the appendage inside the left atrium, which seems uh, in the preclinical uh, phase not to be associated with some complications or problems. Another type of uh, coming device for the future is the endomatic closure. This is like a, a sepia uh, um, anatomy. And you see that this uh, device is supposed to be non tropogenic which fits with all anatomies. It's a suturing like hermetic ceiling. And you see here the step-by-step -step procedure. You have the device coming out at the tip of the catheter of the sheet. And you see here the device coming to the wall and grabbing the wall of the appendage while retracting, continues to retract and you can have a complete occlusion of the appendage without uh, keeping some uh, device in contact with the blood. So the main point with this device is that device closure without leaving the device exposed to the blood is of course a very important point because of absence of risk of device embolization an absence of risk of device-related thrombus in the future. So my conclusion is that uh, multimodal imaging modalities, including CT, is very important to have a good analysis of the appendage and good planification, especially in complex and challenging cases. We routinely use Freemans here for all patients, but we also use uh, different uh, imaging modalities fusion with uh, uh, X-ray and CT uh, overlay during the procedure. We have the FIOPS computer bed simulation, which is very helpful in complex, but also in routine cases to, to, to find the good positioning and to select the good size of the device. We don't use in routine 3D printing, but this technology might have a good, uh, in, uh, good um, uh, re reason uh, to be used, especially for teaching. 
And I think that helping the procedures with dedicated planification is really important. New devices, as you've, we've seen, is better sealing and conform to quite all anatomies and the concept of no implant LAA occluders, uh, which is developed in the preclinical phase now, is, uh, is uh, very promising for the future and for our patients. Thank you very much for your attention. So thank you very much for the excellent lecture, Philip. So uh, he mentioned about the multi modality imaging and also uh, new devices. And uh, so uh, are there any questions and uh, comments from the panelists now? Yeah, some of the new devices are so uh, uh, unique and uh, interesting. So uh, how can you access to the uh, all of the devices you mentioned? No, no, no. We, we just have access in, in, in France to Amulet, Watchman, and Lambry. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other devices that I mentioned are all, or quite all, in the preclinical phase. Only the, the class has been used in uh, uh, feasibility studies and will be, will be challenged in a randomized clinical trial. But the other devices are just in the animal phase. But uh, they are very promising, as you've seen, and we, I'm very excited to see uh, this kind of device uh, for, for our patients. Thank you. So uh, then, uh, are there any questions? Oh, yes, please. Okay. So I, I, I'm so interested in technology of fluoro CT fusion in, in your slide. Is it possible yeah. to use this technology without, without tea or ice, just with only fluoro? Of course, yeah. we've done some cases like that. Uh, we, we keep, as you've said, we keep the, the guidance of TE. We, we're using CT for all patients. It's very important for me to have a good planification, good sizing, safe procedures, but we still continue to go with TE because we have a good relationship with our colleagues and we want the team being complete for this kind of procedures. But you, you're completely right. We can, we can guide a procedure with the fusion, because we have the, the landmarks of the appendage, which make the, the, the procedure much safer. Uh, we, we don't go with the device like with blinded, you see. We can go with the, the fusion and we have a very nice uh, delimitation. We have a very much nice drawing of the appendage and we might have a very good um, yeah, imaging to, to, to do the procedure. We don't use eyes in routine because we don't have reimbursement for this technique. So uh, how, how much percentage of the uh, procedure uh, would be done by the uh, uh, multimodality technique using like a fusion imaging? In my center, all. all. Really? We're using CT for all patients mm -hmm. and we are using fusion for all patients. Great. Uh, but. Um, in complex and challenging cases, I guess it's really important to have uh, different modalities because you see the case we have uh, with the live case transmission from Frankfurt. It was definitely a complex case with a, with a multi-lobular uh, appendage and, uh, and it was difficult to, to, to select the good size and good positioning for this case. So for this case, CT would have been helpful, I think. Right. So Takashi, you, you had a lot of experiences of the CT scan beforehand. So do you have some comments on the like uh, uh, fusion imaging? Or? I, I am the fusion image, but um, in my sense, I, of course I uh, check it uh, CT before proceed, but I don't have any uh, fusion technology in my center. Mm. I want to use it. Yes, so I, I heard the, in Japan, some of the center uh, can use such a um, fusion imaging. Uh, Shusuke, how about your center? Yeah, we can use a uh, fusion, fusion imaging. So, so it is difficult because it's very expensive. <laughs> ah, I see. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Lim, how about your uh, situation? I think, uh, I think you use your eyes for the uh, appendage occlusion. So, but how about the using the CT angio beforehand or, uh, yeah. Actually, I have, I have no experience of the CT merging image during the area appendage occlusion procedures. So I only always use the eyes during the procedure. Interesting. So, uh, 
Are there any uh, questions to the um, uh, Philip's uh, presentation? So, so one, one question is, uh, especially for the measurement, uh, if you use a uh, measurement in CT scan, is there any different uh, strategy compared to the trans echocardiography or just the uh, angiography? Because yeah. we can we can check the maximal and minimal diameter. Sometimes peri perimeter derived some uh, some distance or sometimes a mean mean diameter. So there are lots of some option to choose the optimal size of device. What, what is Absolutely. your opinion? Yeah. Absolutely, it's a very very important question. It's about sizing. How to size the appendage? Uh, we we're using CT for all patients, and we are. Uh, uh, we have a, a, an important look at what is the mean diameter, the maximum diameter, the minimum diameter. We're using the area-based uh, dimensions, but also perimeter-based dimensions, which is very important in elliptic uh, appendages. And uh, um, in most of the patients, we had not so far measurements compared to TEE. We have very good, uh, very good. Um, a comparison with TEE, but in some cases, and even when the pressure is, uh, is more than 10 millimeter in the left atrium, we might have some difference. And uh, I have to say that in this case, uh, uh, my, I trust more in CT than ECO. Uh, it's my experience. We, we have a lot of confidence with CT. We have uh, really, because the, the, the image acquisition is now very well standardized and we have good reliability on the image. We have good reproducibility, good intra-observer and inter-observer reproducibility. So I think that CT is more uh, trustable, more, more accurate than TE in, in some cases when we have some different measurements, when we have some uh, discrepancies between the two techniques. But, but the TE is always very important for me, less for sizing than for guiding the procedure, meaning is the ball okay? Is it too distal? Is it trapped in some uh, pectiny muscles? Is it somewhere where I don't want to go? Something like that. For me, TE is a live um, imaging modality that has to be there for the, for the procedure because it may help, you see, in some complex cases, may help how to go where I want to go. But, uh, but again, CT is something uh, very important for, for our practice. So... Thank you, uh, Philip. Thank you so much for the uh, uh, presentation. I think the uh, because of the time limitation, uh, I think uh, uh, we are now uh, uh, approaching to uh, closing this session. Philip, could you uh, close this session, please? Yes. Thank you very much uh, uh, for your for your time, and thank you very much for your uh, exper ex excellent. Uh, uh, experts uh, panel and comments and questions. We had a very nice session about uh, left atrial appendage closure. Uh, we had a fantastic live case transmission from uh, Horst Silbert in, uh, in uh, Frankfurt uh, with a very nice combination of uh, uh, LAA ablation and LAA occlusion, which is quite uh, uh, very uh, rare to do in, uh, in, our, uh, in, in Europe, for example. And uh, I want to thank you, Dr. Hara, for this uh, commemoration and your excellent talk on the Watchman device. And thank you all uh, for being there, for your expertise and for your time. Thank you very much. And see you later in uh, more normal conditions uh, without, uh, without this uh, video conference. Thank you very much to all. Thank you.